I've talked a lot about the four knights of the apocalypse. We got Tristan, we got Lancelot, we got Gawain, we got Percival. I've only done videos for two of them, but we can't forget their predecessors. I'm talking, of course, about the original Seven Deadly Sins. Hi guys, my name is Dante, and on this video, I'm going to be ranking each of the seven members from weakest to strongest. Now, this isn't to say that each one is, uh, you know, without their falls, but they are superiorly strong in their own way. Each one clearly has their own strengths, but in a one-on-one -on -one fight like a death battle royale, this is going to see who's going to come out on top. And to see why, we'll get right into it. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share this video on what you think could happen next time. So, who is the weakest of the seven deadly sins? At a certain point, it's Escanor. But for overall, it's going to have to be Gother in last. Gother is a doll made by a demon wizard, and his body is, well, it's adaptable and can uh, survive many things, but it's also very fragile. Gother is, in other aspects, the brains of the sin, at least a uh, part of the brain. Uh, Berlin seems to be the other half, but Gother is very strategic and smart. He's the one that mostly comes up with the majority of plans, along with Merlin. Sadly, he might be mostly brain, but he is not brawn. But this does not mean that he is weak. At least, uh, he can't defend himself. He can. His magical power is invasion. If you get shot by an arrow of light, you are just going to be a living puppet to this guy. Ironic, considering he is technically a living puppet. He's just Pinocchio, and he just wants a heart. He wants to be a real boy. Gother's magic can seriously mess you up. Either you live in some sort of illusion that messes with your mind, or he controls your body like a puppet master with strings. He can make you either attack your own ally, or commit Harry Carry in the most brutal way possible. The only way to stop being a puppet is through an outside force, either them knocking you out, or uh, them just ending you. There is no escape from this power. Gother might be a Pinocchio puppet master, but he is also literally a walking bomb. Let's see, let's do some simple math. When you have Escanor sunshine power, plus the four elements of destruction increased by Merlin's own magical power infinity, you get a bomb that will destroy anything and everything within a 10 mile radius. Granted, this is Gother's last trump card in case the worst case scenario was to happen, but Let's just say he has his own trump card. However, because this is a last ditch effort and he can't just keep reusing it whenever he wants, he's placed pretty low on this list because he might be very adaptable and quick and evasive, but in a one-on-one -on -one fight with most of the other sins, he might as well just call in the towel. He might be the goat sin of lust, but he is not the goat. All right, we covered the weakest sin, so who's the second weakest? I'm gonna have to go with Merlin. Again, we're going with another brain of the Seven Deadly Sins. Merlin is incredibly smart, and do not underestimate her. She can mess you up seven ways from Sunday. Not only does she know almost every single spell, but she also has a large variety of defense spells. She can create a ring that will mess you up from the inside just by saying one simple phrase. She can mix magic and become something like the Avatar. Only instead of attacking with water, it's secretly fire. And if given enough time, Merlin can stop you in time. And given that Merlin's magic is literally called infinity, the suffering will never stop. But why did I place her second to last? Well, despite having a large variety of magic, she does require a couple of things. For one, she needs time to cast. Depending on a certain spell and who she's facing, she's going to need a certain amount of time just to think of a plan and create the perfect spell for the counter. Because of that, Merlin would have to heavily rely on defenders while she has time to cast a spell, or just always be on the run, always dodging attacks, so she has to be very quick on her feet and the total spells that she casts are going to have to be very limited. Because she is more brain than brawn, she is not especially physically superior. All in all, do not underestimate Merlin, because this little girl can truly teach you a couple of lessons. Alright, we covered the brains, now who's next? Well, we're going to finally be talking about some brawn. I'm talking of course about Deanne, the Queen of the Giants. Unlike the other two, Deanne is physically superior in terms of strength. I mean, just look at her sacred treasure Gideon. This makes Mjolnir look like a joke. On top of Deanne being able to wield this big-ass hammer, 
It also comes with a special property that can redirect all sorts of magical attack like a lightning rod and into the ground. So pretty much all of Merlin and Gother's attacks can be redirected into the hammer and into the ground. So that's one way she can avoid all sorts of magical attacks. If mad enough, Deanne could possibly just shoot Gother off like a golf ball with her giant ass hammer. With or without it, Deanne's power can easily level an entire city. I mean, just look at what happened to that fighting arena. That town is never going to recover. Not only is the giant clan very versed in controlling Earth itself, but they can turn their entire bodies into metal, which, in fact, can also block hell flames. You know, that very deadly fire from the demon clan that gave Bon his scar, despite the fact that the guy was immortal? Deanne could cover herself in metal and block from an attack like that, so she has a very good defense as well. Deanne is also the most beautiful dancing warrior that I have ever seen in my life. The giants have this very special dance where, if given enough time, can also boost their attack power just by drawing on the powers of Mother Earth. And if you think just shrinking Deanne down to the size of a human is going to get rid of that strength, no. If she punches you while in human size, she's going to shoot you right up like an elevator. She is still that strong. Deanne is the second greatest earthbender ever. The first is, of course, Toph Bay Fong. And that's a fact. Fight me. So despite being, you know, overhyped as a very powerful earthbending giant, why is Deanne the third weakest? Well, despite being the queen of the giants, Deanne is still relatively young for a giant and is thus rather immature and naive. This makes her cute, but in a fight, uh, she can easily be uh, manipulated, especially against bugs. Do not let her face bugs or she will run. Also due to her big size, Deanne is quite easily a very, and I say this literally, big target. If another opponent is smaller, faster, and just as strong as a giant, she will have a hard time trying to evade because they're always on the move and being such a small target will not really be something to keep her eye on. However, never let that stop from us being surprised that Deanne can quite literally shake the earth. Well, every giant needs a fairy. Apparently, this is a very popular duo in the series. Next on the list is King or as his real name is, Harlequin. King is not as strong as Deanne in terms of physical strength, but his power is very great. King's natural power is called Disaster, which allows him to control over life and death. He can either elevate or diminish the natural state of anything within his realm. A slight scratch can develop into a severe wound. Mild poisons can become lethal toxins, or a small tumor can spread throughout your body and make you look like Deadpool, and not in the good way. This magic pairs well with his sacred treasure, the Spirit Spear Chasuble, allowing him to be armed with a numerous array of weapons and tools for combat. King's facing someone all by himself, his spear can become a giant muscle-bound bear. If he needs to stop someone who's incredibly fast, turn them to stone, like as if you'd stared into Medusa's hideous gaze, or your beautiful one, depending on which one you're looking at. Too many enemies? Nuke them with a giant flower. Facing a bigger army? Just turn your spear into like four of them at once and see where it all goes. King is especially strong because you want to know why? He is technically the son of a god. That's right. Just like Melios and Elizabeth, King is the child of another god created by Chaos, aka the Sacred Tree. And this son of the Sacred Tree certainly has made a name for himself across Britannia. Not only has he faced other sorts of humans and fairies, but he also came toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mael, with four commandments. Granted, this guy also killed off two other archangels and the commandment Derriere. And when King unlocked his full wings, he was kicking some demon angel hybrid ass. Despite having the strength on par with a spaghetti plate and allowing a cat to steal his snack once, you do not want to mess with King. He will always protect his giant queen. And now, we've reached the top three. The top three most powerful members of the Seven Deadly Sins. And who's taking the bronze medal? Well, it's... Escanor. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Look, this guy is incredibly powerful, sure, but but it's only conditionally powerful. 
Now, before you crucify me on a flaming cross, I will talk about why Escanor is as strong as he is. Armed with the gray sunshine, or rather a uh, sun, depending on who you ask, at age 20, this guy beat up a mountain with his own human-sized fist. He destroyed the vampire king with simply just being within his presence and mocking him. This guy fought four of the commandments by himself. He made Galen turn into a wimp just so he can turn into a stone because he was afraid to get bitch slapped. Melascula, who was possibly the only one who came close to killing him, ate his soul, but his soul was so powerful and hot, she burned from the inside out that became charcoal. Against Esterosa, in quite possibly the best fight in season two of the season, see, whatever. Escanor was being punched up and down, left and right by Esterosa, but then he sent him flying across the kingdom to a lake and burned him and boiled the entire lake in one fatal blow. And then, when it was high noon, he bitch slapped that mother <laughs> clear across the country. And then there's Zeldris, the brother of Meliodas, and all he did to defeat him was poke him. Not even to mention that this guy also went toe to toe against the Demon King. Granted, this was round two, but still. Do not mess with this man when he gets to noon. I mean, just look at him getting bigger and bigger. He has no neck. This guy calls his hands, swords, and his fingers, spears. It's like Edward Newgate calling his mustache a beard. He is that badass that it can actually work. Death Battle, if you can hear me, please do Escanor versus All Might or Kenpachi. It will be a battle that I will be willing to kill for. All right, I hype this guy up way more as anyone should. I mean, it's Escanor, how can you not? However, I did mention that his power is very conditional. So here's how it goes. Escanor's power grays powers him up when the sun is rising. So during the morning, he's gonna get stronger pretty much every single second until it's noon. And when it gets to noon, run. Pray to whatever god you believe in that Escanor is going to have mercy on you because Here's the hint, he's not. Just pray for a painless death. However, afternoon and as the sun starts to set, he gets weaker. He has a weaker combat class than Hawk. So if you want to beat Escanor, just wait until the sun sets and then literally kick his ass because I have a feeling that simple kick is gonna break all his bones. Another fact about Sunshine is that because Escanor was human, Sunshine was quite literally killing him. This guy coughed off blood. He was dying on the inside. Sunshine was Escanor's greatest weakness and his greatest strength. But when it comes to High Noon, he's going to make Bane from Batman start calling him daddy. All right, Escanor is third. I am very, 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 very sorry. Please be nice to me in the comments. Please. I'm, I'm starting out. I'm sorry. I had to. But anyway, uh... Who is second? Who gets the silver medal? Well, it's Bond. Bond was, in the earlier seasons, quite possibly the uh, fifth strongest, and in that case, it was mostly just last. Bond was always quick, he was sneaky, and he had a magical ability that could drain people of their stamina. He was like a human vampire, but he was also the human punching bag, quite literally. Whenever someone had frustrations, they just punch him, squish him like a grape, they chop his head off, bisect him, chop him up uh, in certain areas. I'm not gonna go into which areas. But Bond could take any sort of punishment because he was immortal. That happens when you drink the Fountain of Youth. But yet also you can't get drunk. Bond had great stamina and speed, but not so much in terms of strength. However, after spending a couple of centuries in literal hell facing the Demon King and trying to get home to your dying wife so you could bring her back, there was something called development. And Bond came back as the strongest human, physically. Uh, the strongest human is now in possession of a certain orange-haired, purple-eyed bigot. But after coming back from Purgatory, Bond could have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Escanor during the daytime. He was that strong. He was killing numerous demons in a blink of an eye. And then he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Demon King. Again. Bond has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Demon King numerous times in Purgatory, two times in the real world, and then, months later, he faced off against the Supreme Deity. And when her attack hit the Seven Deadly Sins in Leonis, most of them went down, but Bond, he was still standing. Purgatory really enhanced this guy all the way to the mask. He's not human anymore, but yet he is. 
He's faster, he's stronger, he's still snarky, and he doesn't need that immortality anymore. Bon has gone from a human punching bag all the way to OP done right. He surely does deserve second place. Alright, and now it's time for number one. And the only one we have left is, of course, Meliodas. Not only because he's, you know, the main protagonist, at least the main male protagonist, but he has a lot more factors compared to the other sins. So let's list them off. Meliodas is the son of the Demon King, aka the literal god of all demons. Literally, he created them all. Not to mention, he was also the leader of the Ten Commandments right before he defected. He was seen as the heir to the Demon King's throne. And they don't just really give that away to anyone. You gotta be uber strong for that rank. Meliodas was killing goddesses and making humans shit their pants when their great 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 grandparents were still babies in caves. After Meliodas defected, he was cursed to be immortal, but every time he died, he would lose a little bit of his emotions. The Supreme Deity did this because she wanted Meliodas to see her daughter suffering, dying, being reborn over and over again. And each time he died, he would lose his emotions and turn back into the bloodthirsty demon that he once was. Essentially, just breaking off his romance with Elizabeth. Ugh, typical. The Supreme Deity is that kind of mom who unpurposely sabotages her daughter's date just because she doesn't like the boy and thinks she can do better. Who do you were gonna pair her up with, Supreme D? Ludo Shell? That creep? No. Be like me, Supreme Deity, we can date anyone we want. So because Meliodas was immortal, he had 3,000 years of experience compared to the other sins who, well, some of them did get 3,000 years, but it wasn't in pure strength. Like, say, the time he entirely nuked Danafor into a giant crater. And then, when he was facing the vampires of Edinburgh, he created a 30,000 foot deep hole in the earth. He was just 6,000 feet away from creating the Mariana Trench. The guy's accomplishments are numerous, but not to mention he also faced all 10 of the commandments at once by himself. And he would have won. He was about to nuke them all out of existence. It wasn't until Esterosa used his commandment that it all really went to, you know, it didn't work. And when Meliodas died, his uh, personality, but I'm just going to call it spirit, was always sent back to purgatory just to face his dad over and over again for months in real time. So it must have been centuries or millennium back then. That's how he kept getting stronger every time he got back. His soul kept getting stronger in purgatory, just like Pond. And from the dialogue that we got between the Demon King and Meliodas, this was not the first time that Meliodas faced death. Meliodas faces dad hundreds upon hundreds of times, finally killing him off near the end of the series. Then later on, he faced off Elizabeth's mother, the Supreme Deity, and killed her off with his brother. Meliodas became God level, just to remove the curses placed on him and Elizabeth. It's like Romeo and Juliet, but the parents found out about it and then they decided to ask God to curse them. It's Shakespearean tragic. And that just proves that Meliodas, who went beyond any normal demon reaching god level, does have one weakness. And that weakness is Elizabeth. This guy has been chopped up, stabbed, poisoned, but he did everything just for his queen. And you gotta respect the guy for that. Alright, I talked about his feats, what else does he also have up his sleeve? Well, the most iconic move, full counter. If you're launching an attack, it's not going to work out. It's just going to be returned right to sender, twice as furious, and you're probably going to regret that later in life. All that is paired with his sacred treasure, Lost Fane. At first, at a level of around like 4,000, it wasn't that great considering all the clones would be weaker. But considering that Meliodas went stronger to stronger to the very top, all of the clones must have gotten stronger. That power level expansion can also be paired with his very iconic Assault Mode, Meliodas has battle modes like Ichigo has Bonkai. Face off against Meliodas and five other clones and you're probably not going to live long enough to regret your actions. With all these feats, there's a reason why Meliodas is always and will always be the captain of the seven deadly sins. And that's it for this video. If you like it, give it a like, subscribe to my channel, comment down below on what you thought about this video and comment of what you want to see next time. Share it, and please help the underworld expand beyond the normal means for other mortals to see. Until then, I'll see you later, guys.